This video has been sponsored by Dashlane. These days, everything requires a password. What's worse is that each of these passwords requires very specific requirements. One number, one special character. It's horrible. How amazing would it be to let one app manage all of this for you? That's where Dashlane comes in. Dashlane is a multi-platform, multi-function, secure password, and digital identity manager. It completely takes the stress out of your everyday login struggles. Never again will you need to remember an endless list of login credentials or click that dreaded forgot password button. Dashlane remembers all of it for you. All it takes is one master password to access your virtual and secure vault. If password security is important to you online, then I highly recommend trying out Dashlane. I've been using them for a while now, and there is no chance that I would ever go back to the old, awful days of trying to remember everything. Click the link in the description, dashlane.com forward slash scared, to get a free premium membership for 30 days. When entering the promo code SCARED, you will receive 10% off the premium membership. Put your trust in me. Get on this. It's dashlane.com forward slash scared. Some background information. I am a male, 29 years old, living in the US in the New England area. I live with my folks, and our house isn't super secluded or anything, but we do have two acres of land surrounded by woods in our backyard, down a rather steep hill. This happened about six years ago now, and nothing like this has happened since. I was home alone for the weekend, as my folks had gone to visit my older brother out of state and I was tasked with taking care of our animals, including chickens, ducks, geese, and our beloved canine companions. We have always had way too many dogs, and at this time we had 10 of them, so taking care of them was a job all on its own. My folks had left Thursday evening, and most of Friday passed without incident, until around 12.30 Friday night. I was still awake in my bedroom, on the computer browsing around, when my pit bull, who we had affectionately named Butters, began to whine at my door, wanting to go for a walk. I didn't mind, as it was July, and the temperature outside was perfect for a nice midnight walk. I grabbed his leash, his collar, and my flashlight, and headed downstairs as he followed excitedly. We made our way outside and down the hill, across the field, and onto a trail that I used frequently for this purpose. The trail led through the woods, and into a clearing with a pond, and another trail that led even deeper into the woods. Butters still hadn't gone to the bathroom yet, so I continued down the other trail, at the same time letting go of the leash, as I knew that he liked to go off the trail a bit to take care of business. Butters took off ahead of me a ways, but he always knew to stay within eyesight. Finally, he took care of business, and I had called him over to me so that I could take hold of his leash again and start heading back when he stopped in his tracks. His ears perked up, and his tail went rigid. He began to growl and raise his hackles while looking further down the dark and twisty path of the trail. I called him over again, worried that he was going to take off into the night after a squirrel or something, but he completely ignored me. He was totally focused on something further on down the trail. I began to approach him hoping to grab hold of his leash, but as I started towards him, he took off like a bolt of lightning down the trail, barking like a mad dog into the darkness ahead. I started running after him, hoping that he would stop but he was too fast, and before I knew it, he was completely gone from sight. I could still hear him barking in the distance, but it was faint, and soon enough, 
I could no longer hear him either. I stopped running to catch my breath as I knew trying to catch up to him was a futile effort at this point. I started calling out to him while continuing to walk down the path, shining my flashlight into the woods, hoping to spot him nearby or something. I was starting to worry, as he usually never acted like this. I mean, sure, he had run off on a walk before, but had always come right back when called. I wasn't walking for long before I heard something coming from further on down the trail. I aimed my flashlight in the direction the sound was coming from. It sounded like something bounding down the path toward me, but I couldn't see anything. Suddenly, Butters came flying out of the woods and down the path toward me. I thought he would stop at my feet so I could grab his leash, but he blasted right past me and almost knocked me over. I started to feel like something was wrong, as I couldn't imagine what had my 100-pound pit bull so spooked. I spun around after him, shouting at him to stop, but just like before, he wasn't listening, and soon, he was out of sight again. Now, I was alone in the dark, without my buddy to protect me from whatever it was that had him running. At least he was headed towards the house this time. I hoped that he would come back at some point so that I wouldn't have to walk the trail alone, but I didn't hear him at all. In fact, it was eerily quiet. No crickets chirping, just an ominous quiet. Needless to say, I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. As I made my way onward, I spotted something in the darkness ahead of me. I couldn't tell what it was exactly. I called out to Butters, hoping it was him, but whatever it was, it didn't react to me at all. I felt very uneasy all of a sudden as a chill shot down my spine and a cold sweat began to form all over my body. I moved closer, hoping to be able to see it more clearly as I slowly raised my flashlight towards it, the light gradually revealing the path ahead until I could see the boots of someone standing on the trail. I jerked the light upwards to reveal a man standing there, facing me. This guy was huge, built like a brick wall, and very tall. I'm 6'1", and this guy looked like he towered over me from where I was standing. He had long, scraggly brown hair and a long, dirty brown beard with bits of leaves and dirt stuck inside it. His jacket was covered in dirt, and his jeans were ripped and heavily stained with God only knows what. He was standing sort of half-cocked, swaying back and forth in place like a drunk. This was private property, but even if it wasn't, it would still be very odd to see someone hanging out in the woods at night. It was very dark and pretty much impossible to see without a light of some kind. I felt nauseous as my stomach dropped suddenly. My knees felt weak and I thought about running, but whoever this man was, he was standing between me and the way back home. I just kind of stood there, my flashlight still shining in his face. He didn't react at all, not even to shield his eyes from the light. It was as if he was in some sort of trance. I don't even think he was aware of my presence at all until I called out to him. Just a simple, Hey, are you all... I didn't even have time to finish what I was saying. The sound of my voice seemed to break him out of his trance, and to my surprise and absolute terror, he began sprinting towards me, screaming like a madman. I stumbled backwards and almost fell over as I turned around to run back down the path, his boots stomping on the ground, his mad screaming approaching fast. He was absolutely crazed, like a rabid animal, and he chased me down the trail further and further away from home. I was panicked at this point. My heart was pounding in my chest as adrenaline coursed through my veins. I was scared, real scared, as I couldn't imagine what this man was going to do to me if he caught me. I know I couldn't keep running in this direction as the trail eventually peters out and sort of dissolves into the woods after a certain point. 
I thought maybe I could lose him if I turned off my light and hopped off the trail to hide and let him pass. The man had stopped screaming and I dared to steal a quick glance behind me. I could see that the man was still keeping pace with me. I shut off my light and pushed myself as hard as I could, hoping to gain a bit more distance between us. The path turned ahead and I thought if I could get around that corner and hide before he caught up, I might be okay. I had never run so hard and so fast in all of my life and it was beginning to take its toll on my lungs. I had asthma and it was getting harder to breathe. When I felt like I had gotten far enough ahead of him, I jumped off the trail and hid behind a large pine tree just at the outside edge of the path. I pressed myself up against the tree and tried to quiet my heavy breathing as much as I could. It wasn't long before this crazy bastard came bounding around the corner. He was a lot closer than I had thought, and I hoped that he hadn't seen me turn off the trail to hide. He stopped about five feet away from my hiding place and began searching around for me. I really didn't want this guy to find me, but I was too afraid to move. He started shouting incoherently and violently thrashing about the brush just a few feet away from me. I had to get him away from me. I slowly bent down against the tree and felt around on the ground for a rock or a stick, anything that I could throw to distract him. Luckily, my hands found a good-sized stone, and I took hold of it and waited for a break in the noise he was making. I wanted to be sure that he would hear it when I threw it. In between the sounds of his thrashing and growling, I tossed the stone away from me and across the trail. It smacked into a tree across the way and fell to the forest floor with a thud. The crazy man stood upright and took off in the direction of the sound, still thrashing around violently and shouting gibberish. I wasted no time and quickly but carefully made my way back onto the trail and took off sprinting towards home. I kept my flashlight on as I was scared I might trip over something. I wasn't running for long when to my horror I heard the maddening screams of the madman chasing behind me yet again. I was tired and still pretty out of breath from earlier, but the man hadn't slowed at all. If anything, he was even faster than before. I was giving it my all, but I could tell he was gaining on me fast. I had made it to the clearing, past the pond, and onto the small trail that led to my backyard. I practically launched myself down the trail. I could see the light from my house at the top of the hill. The man was laughing as he chased close behind. I blasted out of the trail and into my yard, quickly making my way across the field. I got halfway up the hill when I realized I couldn't hear the man anymore. I stole a quick look behind me and stopped in surprise. The man was no longer chasing me. He had stopped at the entrance to the trail and was just standing there, looking at me. I shined my light at him, and he gave me the creepiest smile and wave that I've ever seen, as if we had been playing some kind of game that he had lost. And then, he simply turned around and walked back into the woods. I made it back to the house to find Butters waiting at the door like nothing had ever happened, wagging his tail, excited to see me. I rushed inside to call the cops and they sent a couple officers over. I described the man to them, and they searched around the area, but didn't find anything. Thankfully, though, they stayed and patrolled the neighborhood for the rest of the night, and that made me feel pretty safe. I don't really know what more they could have done in the dark anyway. I couldn't stay mad at Butters for bailing on me. I was just too happy and relieved that we were both home and safe. I never expected anything like that to happen so close to home and on our private property. From that point on, I never went for any midnight walks without a knife and some pepper spray. I work in a well-known nursing home in Australia, which has branches all over the country. The facility I work in is the largest one and has a lot of residents, all with many different backstories. Some are love stories, 
Some are war stories, but some can be horrific, and this one stands out from all the rest. I was working a morning shift which began at 6.30 a.m., and I was delighted to see that I was in one of my favorite wings of the facility. I love my job and my residents, so I always engage with them and have a great rapport with pretty much all of them. When I got to my floor, I began getting the residents out to the dining room for breakfast with the other nurses, and I was sad to see that one of the residents I enjoyed talking to had passed away, and in her room was a new lady. After my moment of sadness, I looked forward to getting to know this new lady. So breakfast began, and the nurse in charge of the dining room asked me to feed the new lady I saw earlier. I was happy to, because I could have a good chat with her over breakfast. Before I went over to her, my colleague said, She can talk, but she's very quiet. I guess he mentioned that because he knew I enjoyed talking to the residents. So I go and sit with her in the lounge, where she was watching the morning news on TV peacefully. I introduced myself and explained that I was going to feed her this morning. She nodded, so I sat down and got to work. My colleague was right. She was very quiet. I worked with that, not pushing for conversation, just letting her do her own thing. Then, a news report about Ivan Milat, a notorious serial killer, came on the TV, and I noticed she perked up a little. The news reporter went on to say how with the new development of technology, it would deter new or would-be serial killers, solve cold cases, and even catch serial killers that remained unidentified or on the loose. As soon as the reporter said this, the old lady beside me let out an excited, loud laugh and said, well, you bastard still haven't caught me. And she continued to laugh. I was taken back and startled. I continued to feed this woman, but for the rest of the report on Ivan Malat, she kept a manic and huge grin on her face that I will never forget. A little later, I had to do paperwork on this lady because she is new and needs to be monitored. I read through her file and my blood ran cold. She didn't have any disease that impaired her cognitive abilities. The only reason she was here was due to an aggressive cancer development. So she wasn't a crazy lady spouting nonsense. She was serious. I am currently in my late 20s, but at the time of these events, my 8th grade school year had just ended. I was excited that I was going to be able to spend the entire summer with my two closest buddies and that we would be heading into 9th grade together. We didn't really do much other than just hang out, play PS2, play some basketball outside, and message girls from our class on Instant Messenger, which I hope most of you remember what that was. If not, then I guess I'm getting way too old. We would usually hang out at my house because my parents were always pretty cool with my friends being there. And the way my house was set up, we pretty much had a ton of privacy, which was awesome for teenage boys being idiots. My house at the time was located on a pretty quiet street, but my neighborhood was in close proximity to the more rough sections of my hometown. A close walk from my house was a corner store that sold really cheap soda, chips, and candy. This was obviously a frequent destination for me and my friends. About a week after 8th grade ended, my two buddies were spending the night like they always did. We thought it would be a cool idea to sneak out of the house after my parents went to sleep and walk to the corner store a few blocks away. Of course, not to do anything crazy, but just to have the thrill of being out late when we're not supposed to be. And being a foolish teenager... I had no awareness of the danger I was potentially putting myself and my friends in. Around 11 o'clock, my parents went to sleep, and that's when we decided to sneak out. At first, the thrill of being out was awesome, but the feeling would soon change when we got to the store. 
We went in there with about $20 and we planned on spending it on snacks. We all split up to grab certain things. I was in the back corner looking at the soda when I saw somebody lurking in the opposite corner. The only reason why this was concerning to me was because he was facing me and not facing the shelves or the products. I pretended I didn't notice him because who knows, maybe it was just a coincidence. As I looked at the Fago sodas, I noticed in the reflection of the cooler that a shadowy figure was now moving closer and still facing me. I quickly grabbed a two liter and went and found my friends. I darted away and when I looked back, the figure was standing right where I had been just a moment ago and still facing me. I was freaked out but didn't want to let my friends know that I was. I also want to add that there was nobody else in the store other than us, the cashier, and whoever this person was. We grabbed our stuff and cashed out. I was trying to be quick about it, but my friends were being stupid and loud, perhaps trying to show off. But honestly, I was just freaking out. We started walking back the several blocks home. I was moving pretty good, and finally my friends stopped and asked what my problem was. I told them what had happened in the store, and they seemed pretty rattled as well. We continued moving quickly. My house was maybe only 100 feet away at this point, when we noticed that the person from the store was now rushing full speed up the hill towards us. We bolted and ran as fast as we could. Lucky for us, the lunatic was still quite a ways away. We ran into the front door and for some reason still tried to be quiet as to not wake my parents. We turned and locked the door, made sure all the lights were off. The person reached my house and started to bang on the front door angrily. That's when I finally gave in to logic and woke my parents who immediately called the authorities. I tried yelling through the door that we called the cops and the person didn't seem to respond. He just kept trying to open the door and continued banging on it. After a minute or two, he took a decorative stone from our front yard and broke the window next to the front door. That is when I finally got a good look at the guy. He tried to climb into the window and the broken glass knocked his hood off. He was completely expressionless. He had dirty blonde hair, was clean shaven, and honestly looked like an average Joe. He was about halfway through the window when my dad came out with a bat and started swinging it at him. Before there was too much of a struggle, we saw the lights and heard sirens. The cops got out of the car screaming and pulled the man out of the window. It was the most intense thing that I have ever seen in my life. The man was obviously arrested. Apparently he had no criminal history and no history of drugs or alcohol. When questioned by the cops, he said, Honestly, I was bored, and I just felt like being evil. We had no idea what his intentions were, but just felt incredibly lucky that we somehow came out of that event physically unharmed. Mentally, I still think about that night over a decade later. I used to stay up for hours thinking if we weren't that far ahead of him, he could have caught up to us and possibly hurt us. I also used to stay up for hours in fear that he would show up at my house again when I least expected it. It just goes to show you that even the most harmless decision can sometimes lead to consequences you regret the most. This is a short story that happened to me several years ago but still affects me to this day. Now objectively speaking, this may not be very scary for others, but the image is burned into my mind and it is something that I don't think I will ever forget. School had just ended three weeks prior and my friend and I were just hanging out, enjoying a surpassingly beautiful summer night. I live in a very quiet little town. There really isn't much commotion or really much of anything that goes on. We have one main school, and our graduating class is tiny compared to most. 
Around midnight, we were pretty sick of playing games and wanted to do something different. He suggested walking around outside on a beautiful clear summer night. Without much hesitation, I agreed. It was after midnight in a quiet town. I figured not much could go wrong. My parents were asleep, but they trusted me, so sneaking out just a walk probably wouldn't have been a huge issue. We ended up staying out for a couple of hours. We talked about movies, wrestling, and what our plans for the rest of summer would be. Up to this point, it had actually been one of my favorite nights in a long time. Just to be able to enjoy the nice breeze, the moonlight, and have some good old-fashioned conversation. We were already on our way back home, and were probably only about five minutes from my house. We were walking down a very low-lit street. On the right side were some old houses, where 95% of the lights were off, and on our left was just trees. My friend pointed out as we were walking that the way one of the lights were hitting the trees, it looked like a person. We laughed at first, but were kind of amazed at how much it really did look like a person. But after a moment, the laughter faded as we realized that maybe this wasn't just a shadow. So like the fools that we were, we decided to explore, and I pulled back a few branches and saw that there was actually a woman standing there. She had a huge, disturbing smile on her face. She was old, probably in her 70s, I would guess. She was dressed normally and had lots of nice jewelry on. She looked how my grandma would dress for holiday parties. But the scariest part was she was just standing there like a statue, smiling at us. For a moment, we just stood there in shock, and within a split second, her smile vanished and she jumped out and made a huge grunt and scream. We ran as fast as we could back to the house. To my knowledge, she didn't follow us or anything. I know most people may not find this particularly scary, but in the middle of the night, when you find a creepy old lady hiding in the trees, it rattles you a bit. Nothing else of note came from this incident, but as I mentioned previously, I'll never be able to get the image of her smiling and then suddenly screaming out of my head. <laughs> if you're like me, staying home alone every day in the summer can become a drag. I've always been someone who needs to stay busy all the time. I don't like being alone and like to always be active. Last year after finishing my freshman year of college, I decided to take a summer job to make some extra cash. I worked for a landscaping company. The owner of the company agreed to pay me under the table based on the different jobs that we did. For the first few weeks, it was great. I was getting super tan and jacked from all the lifting. The first three weeks he paid me and I was getting paid quite well. But by the time we got to the fourth week is when things started to get weird. He usually paid me on Friday, but didn't pay me this week. When I brought it up to him, he just smiled and said that he was going to start paying me every two weeks. I was kind of annoyed, but basically said whatever because I figured that I would have a fat paycheck in another week. Fast forward to the next week. I don't get paid. Now I'm upset. I've been doing hard work for two weeks and not getting paid. I called my boss and asked what the deal was, and he claimed he just forgot and was sorry. I shrugged it off and said whatever, that it was fine. We agreed to meet on Saturday for the payment. I went to the spot that he told me to meet him at, and he handed me an envelope. I took it and told him I would see him on Monday. When I opened the envelope, it was pay for one week. I called him, furious, but he insisted that he paid me the previous week. I flipped out and told him I didn't want to continue working, especially under the table 
and that it was making me uncomfortable. A few days later, he called me and begged me to come back for a huge job that we had next week, and that he would pay me double. I agreed, thinking this would definitely be my last job, and I could take the cash and move on. Monday comes, and I meet him at this huge house surrounded by nothing but open field. We started laying mulch and setting up the front yard. Before I knew it, I was alone. I didn't see him anywhere. I started to worry because I had no idea where he went, and I got a little annoyed that I was doing all of this work by myself. After an hour or so, I finally see him emerge from the back of the house. He looked frustrated and almost a little nervous. He came up to me and in a very soft voice he said, Can you go see if you can get the water turned on in the basement? I tried and I couldn't get it. Please. It was a weird request, but I honestly wanted to get out of the heat for a second, so I accepted. Once in the basement, I found the water hook up in a matter of seconds, but what I noticed right away was that the water was already on. I turned around quickly, and that's when I saw my boss and a skinny woman standing behind me. He had his hands out facing me, and she had one hand behind her back, almost as if she was concealing something. Before I could speak, he said, You shouldn't have come down here, and just so you know, I am sorry. Thinking quick on my feet, I kicked him in his ankle and ran right through the skinny woman. I got to my car and drove away and called the police. The worst part about all of this was that there was literally nothing they could do because I was working under the table and there was no records of this man's company even though I had seen one of his trucks with the logo on it. Fortunately for me, this guy didn't know where I lived. It almost seemed like the company was a scam from the start, but I'm not sure what his intentions with me ever were. I know there is a lot I could have done differently but this is easily the weirdest and scariest experience of my life. Was this psycho really going to try to hurt me over a week or so of pay? Either way, I hope I never run into that landscaping psychopath again. Summer break is an awesome time to kick back, relax, and even enjoy some traveling. Unfortunately for me, my summer break did not consist of vacationing or kicking back. My old roommate Dave was going on vacation with his fiance, and he asked me to take care of his golden retriever Millard. Always trying to make a quick buck, I quickly accepted. I planned on staying overnight with Millard while Dave was gone for a couple nights. Feeling lonely, I asked some of my friends to come over and hang out for a while. We sat outside, ate some wings, and just hung out for a couple hours. I had to work at 6.30 in the morning, so I kicked them out at around 11 and decided to get ready for bed. I put on the TV and made myself comfortable on the living room couch. I started to doze off instantly, and while I was going in and out, I heard the doorbell ring. I kind of jolted awake and just sat still for a moment. I thought perhaps maybe it was the TV, and maybe I just woke myself up thinking it was the doorbell. That was quickly proven false when the doorbell rang again. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I grabbed my watch and saw that it was 11.47 p.m. Who the hell would be at the door at this hour of the night? I slowly approached the door as the bell rang again for the third time. It was a shady looking guy with a backwards cap on. He had a big brown bag in his hand. I opened the front door a crack while still keeping the chain on and didn't open the screen door and I asked what he wanted. In a very soft and unconvincing voice he said, Hi, I have your food delivery. I immediately told him I didn't order any food, 
He proceeded to tell me my address and then followed with, This is your address, right? I have your delivery. More annoyed than anything else, I told him once more that he had the wrong house and slammed the door in his face and then turned all the lights off. The house I was staying in was a split-level ranch, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's kind of like having a a one-and-a-half story house. The basement is usually a living room, and it's not completely underground. The windows are usually eye level. So I went to the basement part of the house and was looking out the front windows. I saw him outside, sitting in his car, with the car not on, still parked in the driveway. I was a little spooked, so I called my brother to tell him what happened. He told me not to worry, and it was probably some kind of mistake. I agreed and went back to look out the window and the car was still there in the driveway, but he wasn't inside of it anymore. I grabbed the dog and locked myself in Dave's bedroom. She barked and growled all night long, not sure if it was because she could hear things or because she was stuck in the room. I hardly slept that night, and when it was time for me to leave for work, I got ready in the bedroom and ran out of the house as fast as I could. I had a brief moment of relief when I noticed the car wasn't in the driveway, but that soon changed when I turned the corner and the car was parked on the side of the road. I went to work, terrified. I blasted my friends that day, asking if it was some kind of practical joke, and they all assured me and promised me that it wasn't them. I came back to feed Millard after work with one friend, and we noticed footprints all around the house and scratches on the siding of the house where one of the back windows were. It looked like somebody had actually tried to break in and were unsuccessful. In hindsight, I realized I should have got the license plate number, but I just thought maybe I was being paranoid. I could have also asked what company they represented so I could call to see if it was a real order or not. When Dave returned, I brought this up to him and he said he'd never had a similar experience. Maybe it was a fluke. Maybe the delivery person was pissed that they got pranked and were now stuck with the bill. Or maybe I could have been in real danger. Either way, this is one summer night I still bring up to my friends when they want to hear a scary story. Being single sucks on Valentine's Day. It sucks even harder when you work in an expensive, fine dining establishment on the edge of Boston Common, bussing the tables of happy, doting couples who are fawning over extravagantly plated dishes. You try to ignore their little displays of affection, focusing on your work instead of being consumed by feelings of jealousy and disdain. Don't get me wrong, Number 9 Park is a great place to work. The tips are killer, but it's still utterly depressing. So in the run-up to this past Valentine's Day, I made myself a little Tinder account, complete with a witty description and a few choice photos. At first, swiping through endless faces was almost as soul-destroying as working a Valentine's shift. Almost every profile either smacked of desperation or dripped with vapid arrogance, but I soon found myself matching with a couple of attractive local girls, as well as a few out-of-towners studying at Boston University. One girl in particular was simply stunning. Her arms were covered in nautical tattoos, intricately colored octopi and jellyfish, while captivating hazel eyes shined almost as bright as her dyed orange hair. Marie, 27, her profile read, Be my Valentine. Now, as a lot of you may know, you have to have a pretty thick skin to use Tinder. Slowly but surely, my matches' replies dropped off as their interest waned. Some even laughed and unmatched me when I said I wouldn't be able to make a Valentine's Day date 
until after 10.30 p.m. when my shift finished. But Marie never ever failed to reply. Sometimes within seconds of me sending a message. Granted, her responses tended to be monosyllabic, almost shy, but she was seriously enthusiastic about the idea of getting together. She said she got lonely on Valentine's Day, and she needed me to be there for her on that night. Sure, it was unusual for me to get such attention, but as I said, it sucks being single on Valentine's Day. I met her after work at a little late night place in Chinatown, the kind of stereotypical Asian place adorned with outdated chinoiserie among a sea of red velvet. She said she liked the garlic noodles there, so I figured it would be a surefire way of getting her back to my place afterward. Marie was even more beautiful in person, albeit with a melancholy look about her as she sat alone at a small table for two, waiting for my arrival. I opened up with an apology, hoping she hadn't been waiting too long. It turned out she was just as shy in real life as she was online. She barely spoke, and when she did, it was just the odd word. I reminded myself that it wasn't exactly charisma that I was looking for, that it didn't matter how shy she was right now, just that I could get her back to my place after a few drinks. We ate in silence, which didn't bother me too much, since I was absolutely famished from a long, tiring shift. Occasionally, I would catch her staring at me, her expression blank and emotionless. Any other time I might have considered it creepy, but let's just say I wasn't quite thinking straight, thanks to the prospect of getting laid for the first time in a while. Once we finished, I paid the bill, tipping the Chinese waiter generously. On previous dates, I had always tried to impress the girl in question with a generous tip. Usually they're pretty impressed by the gesture, associating it with kindness and thoughtfulness. But Marie didn't even react. She just kept staring at me across the table, her gaze unflinching, even as the waiter reached across the table in front of her. We were walking along Boston Common, back towards my apartment, when she finally spoke up. She asked me if I knew the story of St. Valentine, the patron saint who the festival is named after. I remember shaking my head, only too happy to listen to her now that her shyness seemed to have abated. Quietly, in a voice barely above a whisper, she explained that St. Valentine was executed by the Roman Emperor, Claudius, for marrying Christian couples in secret on the outskirts of Rome. I actually thought that was kind of romantic at the time. I tried to lighten the mood by mentioning just that, but she didn't react. She just carried on with the story. She grew a little more animated as she explained that once Claudius had heard rumors that Christian converts were festering in the city's suburbs, he ordered them to be hunted down and punished for their heresy. Praetorian guardsmen, the most loyal of the emperor's soldiers, scoured the city for Christians, horrifically torturing prisoners to extract extensive confessions. One such confession led to the home of a man named Valentine, who when tortured himself, revealed that not only had he pledged fealty to the one true God, but that he was sanctifying marriages of local couples in the name of Christ. Enraged, the Praetorians dragged Valentine into a local square before summoning the townspeople to witness the execution. It was messy, violent, truly horrifying to watch. The Imperial soldier's sword was blunt, an almost ceremonial addition to his uniform. It reportedly took a long, long time for the soldier to hack off the head of the confessed Christian priest. After he was beheaded, Saint Valentine ascended to heaven as a blessed martyr, entered the gates of paradise with his own bloody head cradled delicately in his hands, kneeling before the gilded throne. 
Saint Valentine presented Christ with his own severed head, a symbol of the pure love and devotion that led to his martyrdom. I was impressed. I had no idea that such a brutal story was behind the holiday. I remember turning to ask her how she knew such a thing, but I was met with a gaze that sent a chill through me. She then told me that she had always wondered what it would be like to be the recipient of that kind of love and devotion. The kind that could lead someone to see their own death as little more than an act of loyalty and worship in service of someone they truly loved. It was about this point that I began to actually feel unsafe around Marie. I have since had friends tell me that I shouldn't have been such a wimp, that girls that are a little crazy tend to be the best in the bedroom, but they can't understand the sense of imminent danger I felt as Marie's hazel eyes were fixed unblinkingly on mine. We carried on walking as I racked my brain for an excuse to get home alone, and I eventually settled on something involving having to be up early for work. I knew the lie didn't work. She didn't say a word to me as I flagged down a cab and helped her into it. I told her I would call her, but it was like she could smell the untruth, like this had happened countless times before, and she could recognize the pattern. But it didn't end there. She's been following me for weeks. I made a complaint to Boston PD, but the officer taking the report was practically laughing as he wrote it out. No one believes that this girl could be dangerous, but can you imagine how terrified I am when I walk out of my apartment building and see a stuffed animal sitting on the porch? A teddy bear with its head sawn off? Jagged fluff? dropping from its severed head as it sits delicately in the bear's hands. A lone Valentine's Day card sat next to the decapitated teddy bear, a message written in some dried, dark red fluid. As I opened the card, I began to feel the intense, metaphysical sensation of being watched from somewhere. Be my Valentine, it read. A little backstory before I jump into this. I'm a 23 year old male, and this was my first apartment. It's actually a duplex, but the neighbors on the back side seemed nice, and nobody in the community ever had any issues with them. I moved in with my best friend over a year ago, and everything seemed great. I've spent many nights here with him before I moved in, and I never had a problem. The neighbors seemed nice and the neighborhood as a whole isn't too bad. We have your standard crackheads that stroll up and down the road, but nothing too bad. Before I moved in, I made sure I introduced myself to the neighbors and asked them if they ever had any problems to which they all assured me they have not. My roommate is a Marine, and he deployed to Afghanistan shortly after I moved in. The first month of me living here by myself was great. It was quiet and calm, and that was something I never really had at my parents' house. I have five siblings that were always over there with their families, so it was always loud. Needless to say, I was enjoying myself and my new independence. After the first month of my roommate being gone, I noticed that my neighbors in the backside of the duplex, we'll call them Joe and Susan, started to get into arguments a lot. They were usually over within a couple of minutes, so I never really paid any attention to it. Over time, a couple of minutes turned into an hour, and then two hours, and then all night long. The yelling got louder, and I could hear things being thrown around and broken all the time. It sounded like they were constantly moving furniture and smashing glass. I was annoyed by this and debated on calling the police, but I decided against it because I doubted anything would be done about it. My sleep schedule started to get worse over time, 
and I would constantly wake up covered in sweat and paranoid that someone was watching me. I usually have one to two sleep paralysis episodes a week, so I just attributed it to that and thought that it was just getting worse. Six months into my roommate's deployment, Susan started to kick Joe out almost every week. He would pack his things and get into his car and drive away screaming at her the whole time. Susan worked most nights, and when she would leave for work, I would oftentimes hear him come back and slam more things around and leave before she got home. Sometimes, though, Joe would come back and move furniture, or what sounded like that at least, and I would never hear him leave. Susan would come home, and I wouldn't hear any fighting or any more noise. It was off and on like this for several months before the first major incident happened. It was 3 a.m., and I snapped out of sleep in a cold sweat. I could hear screaming and glass breaking from Joe and Susan's side of the duplex. They were at it again. I peered through my blinds in my bedroom just in time to see Joe throw a TV through their side door. I quickly called 911 and my landlord to explain the situation. Both the cops and the landlord showed up at around the same time. My landlord, Ken, asked me what happened, so I gave him the past five months history of their fights and the noises I've been dealing with. The cops arrested Joe, and Ken told Susan that if Joe came back, he would evict them both. I'm sure you can guess that Joe didn't move out. He bonded out the next day and immediately came back and pounded on my front door. I opened it to see what he wanted, and when I opened the door, I could see that he had a large kitchen knife in his hand. I anticipated this, and he wasn't expecting me to be pointing my AR-15 directly at his heart. Joe, did you need something? Did you put me in jail? No. The police put you in jail. All I did was call them. You better watch yourself, kid. You have to sleep sometime. At this point, I closed the door and called my landlord, Ken. I explained to him what happened, and he showed up with the police five minutes later. I never heard Joe start his car and leave, but when the police searched his side of the house, they couldn't find him. They stationed an officer outside of the duplex for a week, but he never showed back up. Everything was quiet for the next few months with the exception of the constant noise of what I thought was furniture moving around. I didn't see him or hear him arguing, and I thought my life was going to get back to normal. The only thing wrong now was me constantly waking up covered in sweat and my sleep paralysis. Let me explain what it's like to those of you who have never had sleep paralysis. You wake up and you cannot move a muscle. Your mind is awake, but your body isn't. It's common to hallucinate crazy things, almost as if you're dreaming. So when I would wake up every night, unable to move, covered in sweat, and seeing the same dark figure standing at the foot of my bed, I just assumed it was sleep paralysis and that it wasn't real. I assumed that until the day my roommate got back. It was around 2 a.m. when my roommate heard the same furniture moving noises I had described to him. Having just gotten back from an active combat zone, he wasn't taking any chances. He grabbed his service weapon and sidearm and proceeded to clear the house. Every room was cleared except my room. My bedroom door doesn't have a lock on it, so he opened the door and turned on the light. And that's when the gunshot woke me up. When I came to my senses, my roommate was standing over Joe, screaming at him to stay on the ground, and he was telling me to call the police. I didn't understand the full gravity of the situation until after Joe was placed in an ambulance and the police sat me and my roommate down to figure out what happened. Apparently, my roommate was sitting on the couch in the living room when he heard movement coming from the ceiling. Assuming it was an animal, he didn't really pay attention to it. 
That was until he heard something hit the ground in one of the back rooms. After he opened my bedroom door, he saw Joe standing over my bed with a knife, the same knife he pulled on me earlier in the year. My roommate didn't hesitate and placed a shot in Joe's right shoulder. I was not aware that there was a crawl space to the attic in my closet. When the police crawled up there, my blood ran ice cold. I could hear it. What I thought was moving furniture was actually Joe in the attic crawling to my side of the duplex. Apparently that's where he hid when his wife would kick him out and I would never actually see him leave. That's where he hid when the police were looking for him. And then it occurred to me that I was having the same hallucination of a man at the foot of my bed almost every single night. He was watching me while I slept and could have taken my life whenever he wanted. The case is still active. I've changed names and left out a lot of details so I don't compromise the case. But since he's been in custody, I have yet to have that hallucination of a man standing at the edge of my bed. I'm not gonna lie, I had a great childhood. I had loving parents, I, I still do. I got along with my sister. All of my family took care of me and brought me up the best way they could. Most of them were university teachers and researchers, so I also had a pretty big bank of knowledge at my disposal. We never had too much money since my country was going through a pretty bad economic crisis during my younger years, but it was enough to get us a nice little house next to my grandparents, my old man's mom and dad. We were always extremely close. I loved knitting and taking care of the garden with my grandma and watched football matches and carpentering with my grandpa. My school days went pretty smoothly. I didn't have the best grades, but they were good enough. So at 18, when I finally finished high school and managed to get into a good college, my grandparents decided that they were going to give me a pretty amazing gift. I was going to spend a month with them traveling through Spain. For the most part, I had a good time, as expected. The trip bonded us even further, and I loved every minute of our time, seeing beautiful art and architecture. But none of that mattered, compared to what happened in a single, fateful night. I have denied and shrugged off the memories, for an unbearably long time, but something made me remember, and nothing will ever be the same again. I probably will never, ever again forgot what I went through, no matter how hard I try to block them out of my life again, the memories will consume me. This is why I must tell my story, before it is lost forever. It all started during the third week of the trip. We had already visited Madrid, Segovia, and Toledo. Next up was Granada, home of La Alhambra, the most lavish of the Arab palaces in the Iberian Peninsula. It had been the final bastion of resistance of the last Moorish king, where he spent the final days of his reign, a fairy tale town. Too bad it was filled to the last inch with tourists. We were standing at a hotel called Leonardo. I remember that we arrived at night at about 8 p.m. after a four-hour long train trip. The lobby was pretty nicely decorated and shiny, and the staff was nice, so we weren't expecting in the least bit what we were going to find upstairs. It was a pretty tall building for Granadon standards. We were staying in the seconds to last floor, the tenth if I remember correctly. This meant that we had a good view of the whole city, and that was pretty much the only good thing about the place. The corridor leading to our room was old and musty, covered in a pink and peach striped wallpaper that had suffered a few decades of constant humidity, probably from a leaking pipe. It had a low ceiling with a long row of dim lights 
and the carpeted floor with a grayish hue to it that had probably once been beige. The room itself wasn't too different, with the added discomfort of an old bathroom, stained bed sheets, and an old springy mattress that could have been at least twice my age. Nothing like what we had seen in the pictures. Nonetheless, we were more interested in the city itself than the boring old hotel, so we unpacked as quickly as we could and went out for a nocturnal bite and a short walk. Before going out, though, we complained to one of the receptionists about the state of our room. He politely explained this particular hotel had passed through several owners and hotel chains, like an old hand-me-down that no one really wanted, but accepted anyway. Apparently, the owners had only bothered to refurbish the lobby and left the rest of the building just as they found it. Fair enough. The hotel staff had nothing to do with the owner's carelessness. Plus, we had already paid for our stay and did not have the time nor the will to find another place. So we had our supper, got the feel of the town, and came back at about eleven. The first night was surprisingly not bad. We were completely exhausted from the long train ride and wanted nothing more than to get our fair share of sleep. And that we did. I woke up after a dreamless night. I hadn't even noticed the hardness of the old mattress. I felt great. It all started when we were getting ready to leave our room that morning. It was ten past nine when we heard a low knocking on the door. And then there came the voice. Cleaning service. It was an old lady's voice, with a deep Spanish accent. I opened the door and let her in. I gazed at her while she greeted us with a good morning in barely understandable English. She was a very peculiar old woman. Her wrinkled skin was rather pale, but it was covered in brown stains from years of exposure to the sun. Her hands looked rugged and calloused, roughened by years of hard work. She had deep, teary green eyes that contrasted with her silky black mane. I couldn't help but stare at it. Her hair looked so soft that it could have belonged to a ten-year-old. Only the odd gray hair gave it away. We finished grabbing our things and were about to get out, when I suddenly remembered that I'd forgotten to grab my wallet. I told my grandparents to meet me downstairs and went back in the room. Quickly, I searched for the wallet on the nightstand, but I wasn't there. I was reaching under the bed when suddenly, the woman said, Don't worry, I already picked it up. She reached out her hand. I thanked her and took the wallet, and as I did, our skin touched. Her skin felt damp and cold. Too cold. For an instant, it felt as if the body had been filled up with melted ice. A sudden urge to get the old lady out of my sight as fast as possible grew inside me. So I quickly said goodbye, and practically ran out of the room. But as I was closing the door, I felt the coldness grow inside me once again, and turned around. The cleaning lady was staring directly into my eyes, smiling a knowing smile. The smile said that she was in on the joke, and I was not. I slammed the door shut. For the rest of the day, I had the old woman in the back of my mind. Every time I zoned out, I would remember that seemingly unexplained coldness. I had felt deep in my bones. To my great satisfaction, though, I still managed to have a good time. I had managed to convince myself of the irrationality of being scared by a simple old lady. I was such a wuss. But by the time we returned to the hotel that night, I was crossing my fingers in hopes that I wouldn't have to see that woman ever again. My grandparents decided that they were going to stay at the 24-hour lobby bar for a while to grab some tea, but I decided to go straight to our room. I was ready to sleep tight and get ready for one more final tourist's day of non-stop walking in Granada. It wasn't to be. Before getting in bed, I got the sudden urge to have a hot shower. It had been a long day and I deserved it. It was a long shower, while the water flowed through my hair. I thought about how happy the three of us were. 
and of all the pictures and postcards we were going to bring back home. But then the cleaning lady came into my mind once again, and I started to get anxious. Why hadn't my grandparents come up yet? I was about to grab a towel and get out, when I heard a loud bang. The lights suddenly went out, and the water got cold. A power failure. Oh well. I should have expected it from a building in such bad conditions. Naked, wet, and in the dark, I blindly reached for my phone and turned on my flashlight. It was exactly twelve o'clock. Why hadn't my grandparents come back? I wrapped the towel around my waist and reached for the door handle while holding my phone in the other hand. The door didn't budge. I tried harder, but nothing happened. The door was stuck. What terrible timing. Suddenly, I heard footsteps. Great. My grandparents had come. Grandma? Grandpa? Are you there? I called out. No answer. I called out again. Still no reply. I started to get anxious. If it wasn't my grandparents, then who the hell was in our room? And what reason would they have to not reply to my calls? The footsteps continued. I tried the handle again and was about to try to slam my body against the door, but luckily thought twice before doing it. If the person that had come in my room didn't want me to open the door, was it a good idea to confront him? After all, if he was armed, the encounter could get me badly hurt or worse. So I locked the bathroom door on my side as a safety measure and decided to call 911. But then I remembered that I didn't have any service. I hadn't bothered to buy a phone chip for the trip. So I tried the internet, but of course, it had gone out along with the electricity. I was getting desperate. The footsteps continued outside the room for a few seconds. And suddenly, I froze. The footsteps were nearing the bathroom door. This was getting out of hand. And then I heard it. The knocking. Only one thought filled my mind. The cleaning lady. Everything hit me all at once. I felt her outside my door. It was the same agonizingly cold, wet feeling from that morning. But way, way worse. It was the same feeling you get when that freezing early winter rain hits you hard on the face, but deep, deep inside your bones. And there was dread, too. Bucket loads of dread filling my heart. What could she possibly want from me? Was that thing outside the bathroom door even a she? It was too much. And so, I froze. My knees turned to rubber and I collapsed into the corner. Unthinking and unmoving, I was knocked out of my state of trance by a sudden bang. The woman, or should I say creature, that stood outside the bathroom had grown tired of knocking. It banged on the door, harder and louder this time. The door wasn't holding much longer. At this point the adrenaline had kicked in. I placed my phone on the counter grabbed the toilet's ceramic lid, and got ready to hit whatever monster came through the door. Suddenly, the door opened violently. What was standing right in front of me did not look like a monster. There was no mistaking what I managed to see from the dim glow coming from my phone's flashlight. It was the cleaning lady, all right. But she looked nothing like what I had seen that morning. Her perfectly black hair had grown longer it was so long that it spread around the floor like spilled water. She stood naked and still, right at the door, looking straight at me, unblinking. What I saw when I looked at her eyes made me grow still, letting the adrenaline fade away and the coldness and dread take me once again. They were not the deep green shade from earlier that day anymore. In fact, they weren't any color at all. They were white. Completely white. A pair of colorless, lifeless balls. 
Then she started walking towards me, in a perfect line, as if she were being guided by a vector. I dropped my weapon. It was the least human walk I'd ever witnessed. It was as if a creature, some unknown, dark being, had put on a suit and was trying and failing to look like a member of our species. The beast in the old woman's body walked in the same otherworldly fashion until it got right next to me and opened its mouth, revealing a set of perfectly white teeth. I was completely paralyzed. It opened its mouth so wide that its jaw started to crunch and its skin to tear. A gray liquid started to pour from its throat. In that moment, I realized what it was about to do. I felt it in my gut. It was going to take a bite. It was going to feed. Yet I couldn't move. The coldness just wouldn't let me. Then there was another feeling. Acceptance. My body had given up. Given up to the creature. I was to be a part of it. A new skin for its collection, just like the one it was wearing right now. Out of nowhere, I heard a second bang from somewhere in the building, and the light filled my eyes. The power was back. I blinked for the first time in what felt like a million years, and when I opened my eyes, there was nothing in front of me. It was gone. I closed my eyes for one last time that night. The next time I opened them, I was no longer in the bathroom corner. I was laying in my bed the next morning. It was as if absolutely nothing had happened. Had it all been a terrifyingly real nightmare? That is what my body led me to believe. As a coping mechanism, my brain made me forget. It made me think of the events of that night as mere products of my imagination. And it worked. The rest of the trip went by just as expected. I came home just as expected, and continued on with my life just as expected. This was four years ago. Every time I came close to thinking about the events of that dreadful night, a cerebral mist clouded my memory. Two days ago, something clicked. Something that made everything come back to me. It was as if a ticking time bomb had been planted that night in my brain, just waiting for the right time to explode. One night, out of nowhere, I started to dream. My first dream was a perfect recollection of that terrible night, ending just seconds before I succumbed to the creature. Ever since, I had been blanking out several times a week, losing track of time and forgetting whole parts of my day. Spans of several hours have been getting blurry. But the worst part of my day is nighttime, when everything comes back to me. A dream of coldness, of death. Sometimes I can see people, scared people, a dark being always closing in on them. But they can't move, can't run. The cold won't let them. I never got to see the end of those nightmares. Not that I needed to. I have considered several times visiting a psychiatrist, but I don't think it'll do any good. And I'm pretty sure I know why. Even if I don't want to say or think it. I have since come to terms with my fate and the inevitability of the truth, so I'll tell it to you as a final goodbye. I think that that night in Granada, I might not have escaped the monster after all. Only several people know about what happened with Blueberry. I've never told all of the confusing bits and pieces strung together properly. And it took me two weeks to compile this. 
I'm going to start by sharing memories and details that I had filed away extra well, and they've all started flooding back. Sophomore year in high school is when all of this started. That would be 2003. His real name was Michael D, but he was called Blueberry by our circle of friends. I have long forgotten the story behind the moniker, but I imagine that it was selected mostly to distinguish from the many other Michaels around. He was tall, gawky, acne afflicted, and a junior who had a hands in pockets angry walk a deep dimple in the middle of his chin, and an absolutely unintelligible manner of speaking. Unintelligible, to the point where his secondary nickname was Michael Mumble. I don't remember anything particular about that meeting. Really, just a few passing words, and a mutual friend stepping in to wave an introductory hand back and forth while repeating our names to one another in quick bursts, like a squeeze on a rifle. I was a spunky 15-year-old, discovering a whole new diverse world out there. And in retrospect, I see how my giddy naivete left a door wide open for Blueberry to step through. He would talk, well, mumble, to me before first period. I struggled to understand what he said behind his tight lips that hardly ever moved. So our interactions were usually brief and consisted mostly of me smiling brightly and nodding along before politely excusing myself. I often picked up on his awkward anger and aggression, stuffed so deep into his snug six-foot frame. All teenagers are angry. Hell, even spunky me had my moody sprees. But Blueberry's anger was different. It was a warped, twisted, stubborn, narcissistic, permeating, calm, autistic kind of anger. I remember thinking to myself that it just burnt the air around him. So being 15, I had no car. So I took my lunches at a subway that sat two blocks away from the school. Sometimes I went with friends, but more often I went by myself. I liked the quiet and the chance to regroup from school's chaos. He appeared one day, mumbling away across from me in a booth while I pasted on a slightly puzzled smile, lips tight over my mouthful of food, wondering what on earth he was saying. And then the letters came. My best friend Christy and I wrote tomes of notes during our class periods to fold up into neat squares and swap with each other in the halls. This is how we plotted and schemed before the advent of text messaging. We had designated hallways where we would hand off our paper squares. And one of these hallways was where I would also see Blueberry. One day, I just had slyly palmed Christie's note into my hand when I suddenly felt a tap on my shoulder and paper slid into my other hand. It was Blueberry, staring fixedly at me with a slight smile, with a surprised chuckle and a nod of acknowledgement. I tucked Blueberry's note into my purse along with Christie's. I soon found out not only was he Michael Mumble, he was also Michael Muddled. While his handwriting was neat and printed, and I was far from illiterate, I could not make heads or tails of his train of thought. He wrote as he spoke, in a mashed, inverted manner, 
wherein the subject matter was vague at best. All I could make out of the letters he gave me, from that day on, was that I was part of the subject matter. Something about my considerations, or me not seeing, filling up the paper margins, were badly drawn frogs, babbling about druids and more frogs. I got these letters often, usually daily. I probably wrote a short note on the back to him once, maybe twice at most, but they came steadily as ever. As spring wound down, I began to get more and more uneasy around him. To the group, Blueberry was just Blueberry, a slight oddball in any case, who was usually in the background, and I began to avoid him, but he seemed blind to that. In retrospect, at the age of 25, I can safely say that people pick up on when you are avoiding them, but not Blueberry. The lunchtime interceptions and notes continued when he could manage it, and then came the gifts. I was a writer back then. I always had notebooks that I constantly filled up with any scribblings that came into my head. I wrote in the cheap, smaller sized spirals that you can pick up at any drugstore. I knew better than to buy nice fancy ones. They'd last me a week at best. but. It was a fancy, heavy-bound journal that Blueberry gave me one day in the hallway after school. I didn't know what to say. It was an odd gift from someone who I barely knew. There was something tainted about the journal. It was beautiful. A plush notebook etched with the design of an ancient map of China. And I swear the covers were of suede. It was expensive, enchanting, and it gave me the chills. The first ten pages consisted of yet another letter he had penned to me. The first several paragraphs talked of how I was the only one who understood him, and that he loved me. I stopped at that point. I could never bring myself to write in or throw it away. Instead, I tucked it in a keepsake box that slept underneath my bed along with all the other notes and trinkets. I told myself I was giving off the wrong signals. I told myself I was being silly and overreacting to someone who was perfectly nice. Christy told me, you're lucky that someone buys you something so nice without even trying to sleep with you. Friends told me, Ah, Blueberry's just a goof, but he's all right. I was grateful when the summer rolled around. And then came junior year. When school started back up, I had a boyfriend named Adam. Brightly dyed red hair and a red car. So Blueberry inevitably faded into the background, whether he liked it or not. He had no driver's license, nor a wish to get one, strange for being 18, as he was then. He opted for the alternative of a bicycle, and walked everywhere. Looking back, I realised that this made it harder for him to intercept me at lunch, when I zipped off to meet my older boyfriend at home for the hour-long break. The only times I would see Blueberry was when I was pulling out of the parking lot, and I would see him doing his brisk, frustration fueled strides in whatever direction. His eyes were always either angrily fixed at a point in the distance, and his chin in a slight line of frustration, or seemed to be searching the sea of high school students, flooding the parking lot, for who I think was me. Every now and then, he would spy my cherry red Volvo station wagon, which was embarrassingly hard to miss, and he would stare. For the most part, humans can get a decent read on others. This wasn't the case with Blueberry. 
I could make neither heads or tails of him and his behaviour around me. And eventually, my teenaged hormones finally said, screw it. By which I mean, I made no more efforts. I decided that the best way to fix the situation was to not give a shit. If he talked to me, I would respond with short sentences, then bluntly turn and walk away. I didn't avoid him, neither did I approach him or wave at him in the hallways like I had the year before. He was just another guy in the background. Let me add that in the meantime, the letters never stopped, and the gifts came almost like clockwork. A journal left on my car, with the first four pages scribbled with words that I never bothered to read. A bouquet of daisies or roses given to me in the hallway that I promptly gave to a lonely looking freshman as I turned the next corner. A book of fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen to be exact on my birthday. Also with an inscription inside. The journals, books and letters were hardly ever actually read nor used and all found a new home in that keepsake box underneath my bed. I could never explain why I felt compelled to tuck them into the keepsake box, but I just did. At times I would feel guilty, and I would look for anything that I was doing to lead to this insane boy. What on earth compelled him? in order to buy things for a girl that just didn't care. But in the end, my teenage psych always lost interest and went back to scheming over how I was going to work around curfew and catch that wicked show happening at the local music venue on a school night. My junior year of high school wound down much like this. When school let out for summer, I was just happy to be able to be with friends and not worry about Blueberry as he was a senior and had been in his last year of school with us. I came home one afternoon and sauntered into the kitchen to grab a snack. My father had come home from work, barely beating me by five minutes, as I could tell by how he had already taken off his jacket and suitcase. Anne had brought in the mail. This was part of his workday routine. I could time the man by his routines practically, and he was leaning against the kitchen counter and plucking the bills from my mother's overflow of catalogues. When I came up to peck him on the cheek and offer one of the two apples I had retrieved. Hey there, Han, he mumbled taking the apple. Whoa, hold up, kid. You have mail. Lucky you. He flipped a rectangular manila envelope towards me, and I took it. Who's sending me snail mail? I think to myself, popping open the sealed flap. Maybe it's grandma. Oh, does it feel like a check in here? I start to hum a Smith song as I pry open the brand's that anchors the flaps. Girlfriend, in comma. Oh no, I really didn't want to see her. Pull the letter out, and it's a single page of lined notebook paper. Shake the page. Girlfriend, in coma. My eyes focus on the first line. I really didn't want to. Shit. I knew that handwriting. Blueberry. I remember yelping in surprise and dropping the letter, as it had burnt me. I remember grabbing the envelope and flipping it over to see where the addresses should be. And I don't know why, I already knew it wouldn't make me feel better to see the street numbers I called home, along with my name carefully printed in the centre. It didn't make me feel better, however, to see that a city in Colorado was listed in the top left return address. Blueberry had left Texas, or so I hoped.
because it sure made me sick to see that there was no postage stamp. He had to have hand-delivered it to my home, which he had somehow tracked down. The letter frightened me, in both its content as well as the fact that Blueberry had found out where I lived. I grilled all of our mutual friends, and all swore that they hadn't been the ones to give out the information. In the letter itself, he had sounded almost angry with me, or upset, that I hadn't made good on several sorts of agreements. Thankfully, that was the last I heard of Blueberry. Well, for a few years anyway. Those events took place in 2005. Fast forward to spring 2008, where I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but preparing to move back to my hometown to kick a nasty drug habit and get a fresh start on life. I had taken a break from packing up my apartment and headed to the library to clear my head and check my MySpace. All hail 2008. There was a friend request waiting for me. Yup. The cliché reappearance that the protagonist soon ruse. It was Blueberry. Still to this day, I have no idea what possessed to accept the request. But I did. God damn it, I accepted. And immediately I got a message from him. It was quite civilised, actually. He asked how I was doing, and even offered an apology for his behaviour in high school. I was pleasantly surprised, and appreciated the gesture, and sent him a response saying so, along with a brief synopsis of my plans on moving back home, only after ensuring that he was still in Colorado, as his profile said. By the time I clicked send, my allotted time on the computer was up. So I logged out and headed back to my place to prepare for the move home the next day. Three days and one state later, I was back at home and finally feeling human, as the bumps and bruises of the move subsided. It had been a very busy few days, and I gladly plopped down in front of my father's laptop to check my emails and social media. I logged into my MySpace and began to work through the stacks of accumulated messages. I opened the reply from Blueberry. It had been sent almost instantly after I had sent mine several days ago. Well, that's a coincidence. Blueberry was moving back to our hometown as well. Godspeed to him in all endeavours was all I thought of it. I didn't think I would be running into him often, as our old group of friends had long since disbanded to get married, move away, or to get locked up. I had just picked up a job waiting tables at the 24-7 diner chain, Denny's, and enrolled in a summer college course. Life went on, but not for that long. I had just started the swing shift at work. And I was at the counter, filling up salt and pepper shakers, and setting up on the floor before the dinner rush hit, when he walked in. I knew who he was, while he was still in my peripheral. He slid into the swivel chair and mumbled what I can only imagine was a hello. Then, he put his right hand on mine, which was wrapped around a salt tumbler that I had been refilling terror and confusion paint my insides. Another spike in blood pressure as he squeezes down hard, if only for a second, before releasing his grip, and he starts to mumble. I should have told him to piss off that day. I should have listened to my gut, which was screaming profanities at my rationalising everything away brain. I knew that he moved from Colorado back down to our hometown because I was there. I knew that he had taken my reply on MySpace 
as a sign of declaring my undying love to him in his twisted mind. I knew deep down that he was the same scary dick that found out where I lived in high school. But a part of me had truly thought that he had matured past the point and that all was wishful thinking. Instead, I smiled politely, nodded, and excused myself to do anything but be around him. I ended up going to the bathroom and dry heaving. Anxiety, it's a bitch. I was stuck. I was the only waitress on the floor until seven, which was a good three hours away. And I had a credit card payment due in three days. I couldn't leave the floor. I remember talking to myself like a crazy person. He had only said one word. I was being ridiculous. Nobody is twisted enough to do that over a girl that's barely spoken to him or returned any affections. Ludicrous. And who knew what he actually said back there, or what he meant by touching my hand. He could just be surprised to see me. So who's the crazy person here? Me. Then, why did he look at me as if he were gloating? As if he was hungry? Dry heave to the porcelain gods again, and then I dart off to the floor. I stay busy, staying away from the counter, and staying away from Blueberry. Unbeknownst to me, while I went about avoiding him, Blueberry applied for a position as a dishwasher, which is always open in diners, and was hired on the spot. I found out the next day as I clocked in, and saw him carefully studying the employee schedule. I should have said something then, but I didn't. I was afraid. I didn't have time to think either. I managed to somehow change clothes, tie my apron, dry heave yet again from anxiety several times before my shaking legs found their way onto the floor. Like I said before, so much of it is a blur. I don't remember specific incidences happening up towards the end. I remember Friday night bar rush when he yelled at a 65 year old man, a regular of mine, and the reason he yelled was because he thought he was looking at me with perverted eyes. I remember how many times he tried to stop me while I was neck deep in the weeds with drunk and hungry customers, catching my arm rougher each time and make me stop and look at him. The last time he grabbed me so hard, a bruise bloomed in place of his fingers next morning. I remember the look of pure hatred and frustration that he gave every one of my male customers and I remember how he said he would slit them from ear to ear if they ever touched me. I remember when my shift ended and I held all of it in until I made it into the walk-in freezer. I had just let out a half sob when the freezer door had swung open and Blueberry had made himself in front of me. I remember the metallic taste of fear as I looked up at him. What next? He was looking forward to the talk we would have after work, he said. Oh, the talk about us. Oh, God, no. I remember wanting to scrub my forehead with lye from where he bent down and kissed me before exiting the walk-in. He made me sick being so close to me. Dirty. I remember the desperate need to leave. I clocked out, knowing that he wouldn't be off work for hours until after I was. I could escape. I pulled out of the parking lot and stopped at a red light two blocks down. Find a friend to stay with. Figure all of this out. God, I need my job. Then the passenger door opens. Shit! It's him! When the hell did my passenger door not lock? Shit, did he? He broke my lock. Shit, he's in my car and I am numb. He acts like this is a normal thing for us to do and my logic freezes. 
He gives me directions to his house, telling me how happy he is that I came around after all these years of denying that what was between us was real. I couldn't breathe. A part of me is giving up. A part of me is so angry at myself for being so weak and unable to stop all of this. Wait, I'm not completely numb. There is some anger left in me. I'm starting to get angry at this person who has repeatedly refused to take no for an answer, who intentionally came back to our town with the narcissistic, presumptuous intent of claiming me, now that I had supposedly come around. He came into my job and made sure to move fast, hard and aggressively, because he knew this was what I would do. The only words I had ever heard him speak clearly and without a single mumble was a threat to slit my customer's throat from ear to ear. He walked out of his first night of the job just to follow me and got into my car as I was at a spotlight. Screw that. As I had the opportunity to sit and process the absurdity and increasingly disturbing levels of the situation, I became temporarily lost in a fugue state of memory, realisation and gritty resolve. We reached his place and I snapped back to reality. Immediately, I saw that the front lawn was teeming with drunken partygoers. His roommate had thrown a keg party that drew enough people to fit a high school stadium. To this day, I consider this the only reason I felt brave enough to do what I did next. There were too many people around to see and hear things. I knew it, and he knew it, and he didn't seem happy with it. His face is one that still haunts my nightmares. That was rage, like a child having his toys taken away from him. That's exactly what I was to him, I later realised. I followed him into the house. I let him take me to his room. I stood in the open doorway and balked as he tugged on my wrist to pull me into the room for God knows what reason. And it was like another person was speaking through me. Stay the hell away from me. I never have and will never be interested in you, as a friend, or anything else. You know what the hell you have been trying to do. And you've been trying to do it since I was 15. Don't come near me again. You need professional help, you son of a bitch. Then I realised how quiet it was. I swear to God everyone in the party stopped and stared at us. It was so quiet and all the blood in my body was pumping in a war dance of fear disguised as rage. I saw him falter, and we locked eyes. I could tell he was grasping, and then I tried to pull away, but he was strong. Shit. Then he screamed. God, I'll never forget how angry he looked. He wasn't mumbling. He screamed so clearly. Just lay with me tonight. Why won't you just lay down on the bed, you... He lurched forward, like a tension-bearing spring to drag me into the room. It was at that point that the bodies flew at him. Several of them. They tackled Blueberry to the floor. Beer was flying everywhere. The froth was landing in my hair, and my shirt was wet with the faint scent of fresh hops. There was screaming, hands on hands, girl hands. Nail was digging into Blueberry's iron fingers. I could feel my blood slowing at the pockets where he had me firmly. My arms must be blue, I thought to myself. And I saw the girls, three of them, blonde and red. They all yelled to run and to get away from him. His fingers are slipping claws. But the long, solar nails of the three women are too much, and he flinches with a jerk that forces him to let go. He disappears under the heap of bodies, 
and my legs worked again. I ran to my car and ran the hell away. I still don't know who the men who tackled him were. Neither do I know the names of the women who scratched their own nails into Blueberry's skin so that he would let go and they could flank me in protection as I ran to my car. Still, to this day, I don't think I've ever been faced with a truer definition of solidarity than that act right there. They didn't even know who I was when they all dove in. I don't know what kind of spiritual forces out there roaming the purple evenings with those who were alone, but more nights than not, I say a little thank you to the skies, hoping at least one of them hears me. I owe those strangers a great deal. Now that I've said that, the thing of this part of the story is, it's not over. It hasn't gotten bad yet, not by a long stretch. At this point, I wish I could say that it was all over, but it wasn't. Stalkers are persistent. They don't think like you and I do. What I had done the night I told Blueberry no was something good and bad. Good in that I had acted loudly enough to become a person to him, not an object. Bad in the sense that I had set down boundaries that conflicted with his intents. And I had done it in a crowd of people, profoundly embarrassing him. I knew that where he had just seen me as a living doll before, he would now see me as someone to be punished. This is what I thought to myself as I stared at the ceiling, stained with the sharp gold light of noon sun. I had barely slept after crashing through my front door and quickly, desperately, checking each window and door's lock in my father's house before collapsing into a heap by the bed. My father wasn't home, as he usually stayed over at his new girlfriend's place. I didn't mind. It was nice to see him in love. It took the years off his face, and I didn't want to put those years back on with my predicament. I didn't want to see the look in his eyes if he saw bunches of broken blood vessels blossom that ran up my arms in dull spirals of pain. Didn't want to see him and Blueberry in the same room either. No, I didn't want him to feel disappointed or upset in me. I had kicked the habit and worked diligently on my decision-making skills, but my helplessness in dealing with Blueberry seemed to me a return to life that I thought I had left behind. No. It was better to figure this out myself. He had spent enough sleepless nights worrying about me. I was suddenly thankful for my parents' recent divorce. My mother stayed behind in the house I grew up in, and my father had rented out a lovely house in an adjacent neighbourhood. Blueberry couldn't possibly find me here. With that comforting thought, I pulled myself out of bed and dressed. I remember picking a shirt with sleeves that covered the bruises he had left. I didn't even care that it was easily a hundred degrees outside. Anything to keep from seeing and remembering his brand on me. I padded towards the kitchen, stopping at the large glass window panes. I padded towards the kitchen, stopping at the large glass window panes that faced the open schoolyard across the street. Pulling back the blinds, I took in the grassy, sun-drenched view. I liked the house. It was open. I could see anybody coming. But it was quiet for now. In the kitchen, I stepped into the cupboard and plucked a fresh bag of chips. I was starving. I had just started to pull open the bag of chips when the banging started. They were a parody of polite knocks. I had no idea how he found me. Still, to this day, I don't know. But it doesn't matter how. Just that he did. But I knew who was behind the door. Just as that person knew 
that I was hiding in there somewhere. At the very first echo of Blue Bree's fist hitting the front door, my legs turned to dust beneath me. The bag of chips burst as I collided with the linoleum. My body's momentum transforms the potato shards into millions of traitors echoing every move. I was sobbing silently, hiding behind the fridge and watching the shadow slide along the floor where I had been just seconds ago, gazing out the window with that false sense of safety. And then he knocked again, and then there was silence. My phone buzzed on the counter. I stretched my arm upwards and clutched that little electronic beacon of freedom. A text from 303 area code, Colorado, him. The text illuminates the screen. My dear, I know you're there. Let me in. I have your favourite Subway sandwich for you, and a surprise. Jesus, how did he get my number? My sleeve has been pushed back from the reach of the phone. I see the bruises again, a friendly reminder from Blueberry. Some of them are the same shade as his name. The knocks have been quiet, and there are no more shadows on the wooden floor by the window. I remember that there was a click in my brain at that moment. Something finally connected. My survival instincts have finally triggered, as I shift from frozen to overdrive. I am no longer a human. I am a gazelle running from a lion. Chips crunch under my shoes as I snap up to my feet, keys and phone in hand, and run for the sake of everything I love in the world. I hear metal creak behind me in the kitchen, just as I slam open the front door, and all the sunlight outside charges every cell in my bruised body, and from the front steps I dive into the car through the open passenger side window. I leave the perfect arc of rubber marks on the driveway as I reverse, swivel my head and scan the yard for him. There is nowhere to hide in this wide open neighbourhood. Nothing. He is unseen. The gas pedal is one with the floorboards. I am thankful that the students of the elementary school across the street are not out for recess. Because I would braid them into the sticky tarmac without a second thought if they had stood between me and my safety. That is my level of fear. I keep driving blowing through all yields and stops. I wonder if I'm crazy, and my phone buzzes with another text from Colorado. No, not crazy, scared, not of death, not yet anyway. Scared of what he will do to make me return to his normalcy. I am a doll to him. What happens when the doll starts to speak? When they run like a gazelle away from his playroom rules. What happens if the lion catches the gazelle? I dry heave and sob at once. Oh God, the fear. I feel like he's with me right now. Watching. It does occur to me to call the police. But what do I tell them? They would look like I was crazy. Just like everyone else had reassured me that Blueberry was fine, just odd. So very odd. Maybe. I still am crazy. I am 55 and a 25 year old after all. But I know that I can't be alone at this moment. I pick up my phone and dial for Brandon. He lives the closest and have to read our twice. Blueberry keeps texting and the alert makes me exit my keypad. His messages tell me about the lack of appreciation for the things he does. I dry heave. I'm still going. Finally, I'm able to input all seven digits. Hello? Brandon's voice is an angelic sound. I cry. All that comes out is the name of the street I'm on. He directs me to a park a block away from where I am, 
and I see him. He sees me. I leave the keys in the ignition but turn off the car, and I run across the green field to him. I feel like I can't do anything but run for dear life. Brandon catches me, holds me tight in the arms with two big hands. My bruises hurt under his palms, and my lungs are on fire. I can't stop my legs from twitching. I babble. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. He found me. Please don't tell him where I am, Brandon. Please. And I collapse on the soft grass. Brandon tells me later that he pieced the story together from what he could hear me say, curled up in the fetal position on the grass, babbling about blueberries, bruising, and being an object. He wasn't sure what to make of it, and admits that he thought I was back on the shit and was just having a bad come down. Then he goes to retrieve the keys from my car and the ignition. My phone is on the front seat, still lighting up incessantly with messages from a 303 number. Brandon sees this. He opens my phone and reads several of the 52 messages sent in the last half hour. That's almost one every 40 seconds. He says he couldn't bear to read any more after seeing the one that included a photo of my open underwear drawer. It dawned on Brandon that Blueberry is inside my home and enjoys letting me know. Brandon hugs me and talks with me until Carly and Kate get to the park. Carly and Kate will take me to their house where we will call the police. Brandon has warrants, so he can't be with there with us. But before he leaves, he hugs me so fiercely that it reminds me that I am real, not plastic. He whispers into Carly's ear and advises her to check the messages on my phone if she doesn't believe. She makes it to the message where he tells me he will shave my red harlot's hair off if I didn't come back and be good. My phone rings and Carly answers. It's my father. Kate drives my car home. They stay as I hear what has happened. The next door neighbor had been in her kitchen when he saw me run out the door and peel out of the driveway. The clue, she said, was how I had thrown myself in the car through the window as if I couldn't waste a minute opening the door. She went closer to her window to watch the scene as my car faded away. She looked at the front door of the house and she saw a tall, thin man coming out of the front door and staring in the direction I had gone. She said he looked angry and I looked terrified. She called the police. My father, unaware of this, came home soon after the neighbours called the police. Blueberry was back outside on the porch by then, perched on his step, watching and waiting. My father stared at the strange boy on his steps. He saw the tire tracks and the absence of my car. Blueberry calmly looked up at my father, met his gaze, and blankly said that he was thinking about getting her a vanity for her birthday. My father tells me that Blueberry stood up and placed himself between my dad and the door. My father was a criminal defense attorney for 30 years. He is a stoic, tough man who has defended countless rapists, killers, thieves and addicts, and the truly innocent before a jury of peers. Not much shakes him. Yet the tremor in my father's voice is perceptible as he tells me this. He stares Blueberry down and simply says, Do you pay for this house, boy? I don't answer to you. Get out of my way. Blueberry moves, and my father goes inside, disturbed by the boy on the stairs and glad that I'm not there. In the kitchen, he sees the crushed bag of chips on the floor, the mess in the kitchen, and he could see the signs of frantic movement etched into the carpet of chips. He can see that the back door is wide open, and that I would never leave it like that. He also remembers that the front door had been unlocked. He and I 
shared a paranoia of unlocked doors, and it was then that my father knew something was very wrong. He feels sick. He sprints to the front door. Hey, kid! He roars at Blueberry, retreating back. He had taken off down the street when he heard the sirens. The police cars called by the neighbours pull up at this point. One patrol goes in pursuit of Blueberry, and the others stay talking to my father, who is calling my phone, and our astute neighbour, who relates what she had seen through the window. The police ask if I knew who this man was on the stairs, and Carly gives them my phone as an answer. My father sees one of the pictures over the cop's shoulder, turns pale, and closes his eyes. I see the years go back on his face. I can't stop crying. I can't get a word out. All I can do is lead them all to my bedroom, where Carly holds up the bed skirt as I reach underneath and pull out the three keepsake boxes that I had filled with the last five years' worth of Blueberry's gifts and mostly unopened letters. Carly brings me a yearbook, and I cry harder and harder as I open up the page with his class photo on it and point at his full name. I am crying this hard because it's over. I'm crying this hard because it could have been over long ago before this point. The officer bags up all the contents of the boxes and flashes of cameras capture any traces of what had happened that afternoon. I give a short statement once I can speak coherently. They don't find Blueberry, but my father secures protective orders quickly with the connections he has. He looks so tired. It must have been so easy to protect me when I was small, when he could be the barrier between me and the monsters he dealt with on a daily basis. But that time had long since passed. All he could do now was make phone calls and pray to a God he didn't believe in. He did not tell me about the journal left on the doorstep until years later. The one that he didn't turn over to the police. The one that had photos of me sleeping. Photos of me naked fresh out the shower. Even some of me kissing my ex-boyfriend. Adam's face in these was scratched out and left hollow. All of them taken. At times I had assumed I was alone. I arranged to stay the night with Carly. She tells me the next morning that I had started screaming in my sleep, and I did not stop until she crawled into bed with me and wrapped her in her tiny arms. I am grateful to her. I think her touch is what kept me from remembering any nightmares I had that night. It felt so good to just sleep. We moved soon afterwards, my father and I. We spoke of the incident only once more, when I walked into the kitchen of the new house and saw my father at the table with bourbon in his hands, flipping through a mound of papers with the other. They were the letters from Blueberry. He had retrieved them after evidence processed them. He intended to put them away in his safety deposit box. I'll never forget the grim reasoning behind his voice as the lawyer in him spoke. Well, if you ever turn up murdered... At least I'll have this and the journal to prove exactly who did it. So this all happened throughout my high school experience. I'm currently a junior at my school. And this all started the second semester of my freshman year. The first incidents were close to the end of the freshman year. There were a few my sophomore year, and there has only been one so far my junior year, and it's all completely true. I tried looking for the police records that go with it, but I couldn't find anything because of how long it was. The guy in question, I'll call him Alex, is Asian with really short hair and something like 5'4". He's in the same grade as my oldest sister. He's also an avid user of cigarettes, alcohol, and the likes. He even bragged to me that he got his license taken away because he went 60 miles an hour above the speed limit on a highway. 
a damn highway with a limit of 65 miles per hour. That meant he went at 125. So basically, an ill-behaved boy was chasing a really good girl. I'll give you the entire story now, and I hope it makes everyone who reads this a little more careful when making new friends. The second semester of my freshman year, I took an art class in hopes to get an elective credit. I was sitting with some friends talking about the projects we were making, and Alex walks through. I'd never noticed him in class before, which was really strange. I should also put this on a timeline for you, to make this a little easier to follow. It was close to prom season, so early March, and luckily close to the end of the year. He started talking about whatever, and we really hit it off. After a week, I started seeing him popping up around me, in the hallways, outside my classes, and he'd talk to me during passing time. I didn't think much of it being the stupid, naive child I was. I should also mention that he rode my bus in the afternoon. Alex and I would sit by each other on the bus and talk, which just encouraged further interaction with him. One day, my older sister, who is two grades above me, didn't have theater practice after school, so she took the bus home, and when she got on, she saw me next to Alex. Her face had turned white, and she sat down near the front of the bus. I thought it was really strange, so I planned on asking her about it when I got off the bus, but I forgot to. As prom got even closer, Alex kept talking about it with me. My friends and I all assumed he was going to ask me, because not only did he follow me around, but he wouldn't shut up about it, and he was clearly showing signs of interest in me. Unfortunately for him, however, I was in a relationship with someone at the time, and it was a girl. I had absolutely no interest in dating him. If he did ask me, though, I would need to say we'd need to go as friends. Thankfully, Alex told me instead that he'd like me to tell Tanya that if she didn't have a date, that he'd love to bring her. Almost immediately remembering the incident on the bus, I just said, she's got a date already, but thanks, wanting to protect her. Over the next few days, Alex actually started talking about sexual statics. Things like average length of someone's manhood, or the average age someone loses their virginity. I got super uncomfortable about this, and told some of the boys in my class that if it got brought up again, I'd go sit with them. And they gladly offered to protect me. This was my first set of red flags. Another instance that set off red flags about Alex was when I got home, and the doorbell rang. I looked out the window and saw Alex there. This wasn't the strangest part, because I got off the bus before Alex did, so we saw where I had lived. I yelled to my mom that someone was here to see me, and I went out on the front porch to go talk to him. He was with his friends, and yelled to them that he was going to catch up with them later, and he wanted to talk to me first. He told me about some mundane stuff, and I was getting bored. So bored, in fact, that I just bluntly decided to ask him if he liked me. I was tired of him always beating around the bush, and I just wanted a stupid answer. Alex kind of froze and danced around the subject, confirming my suspicions. The way he avoided telling me that he liked me was really strange, bragging to me about his drugs and illegal escapades. My dad was also just coming home from work at the time too, so I had an excuse to leave the really uncomfortable situation. When my dad came in the house, he told me about how nice Alex seemed, and I looked over to Tanya and she looked upset about it, but neither of us said anything. Later on, not on the same day though, I posted a picture on my Instagram, and he commented on it. I still don't know how he got my Instagram to this day. He commented his phone number, telling me to text him, and that my dad was really chill. And along with the demand for me to text him, he continued to almost harass me on the direction of messaging on Instagram, asking to hang out. This was another red flag that set things off for me, making me weary of him, and I decided that I needed to be very careful with him from now on. In early May, he continued to follow me from class to class, but from a further distance. This was absolutely mortifying, but my girlfriend at the time thought it was hilarious. She said that it was funny seeing a strange boy chase a gay that had no chance with him. I laughed with her on the outside, but internally, I was really scared. It was at this time frame that he actually showed up in my window. I should mention that my parents weren't home at this time either. 
They were out grocery shopping while all my sisters were home alone with me. I was done with all my homework, and I was practicing my makeup skills so I can do the makeup of a few girls that were going to prom. I had my earbuds in, and I was listening to my music. When I heard some sort of tapping noise, I took them out, listened intently for a moment, then popped them back in. I heard the tapping noise once again, and took my earbuds out again, once again listening. This happened a few times until I just kept my earbuds out permanently. I finally heard it again and found it coming from my window. I quickly wiped off my makeup and grabbed a pocket knife that I kept under my pillow. I opened my curtains and saw Alex just standing there. He was strangely dressed in a three-piece tuxedo with a single white rose. He said something and I couldn't hear him through the glass. I yelled through the glass I was going to come outside and talk to him. As I walked up the stairs to go outside, Tanya came up to me, terrified. She told me not to go outside, and I asked why. She told me that Alex was outside, and that he was dangerous. She revealed to me that he stalked her for her freshman year, and followed her around the way he did me. We both panicked together, and I heard the garage door open, signaling that our parents were home. We ran to the foyer, telling our dad that Alex was outside and that he needed to do something about it. He walked over to the side of the house where my window was and talked to him. I never knew what he said, but it kept Alex away for a while, which was really nice. But things suddenly got a lot worse from there. Alex started talking to me again, but this time it was about sex and drugs, even worse than before, telling me about all the drugs he had with him and about all the girls he screwed going into extreme detail. I went to go sit with the other boys in the art class, but it did nothing. He still talked about it, even making one of the hockey players uncomfortable. They did their best to shield me, but it only went so far. This was my final red flag. Before I deleted his number and blocked him on Instagram, I was too uncomfortable to put myself through any more social interactions with him. The worst it had gotten, though, was two days before the last day of school. I was getting ready for bed, around 10 p.m. when I heard a knock at my window. I once again grabbed my knife and looked out my window, assuming the worst, but praying for it to be just the bushes outside my window. I saw the very dark outline of a figure, and my heart had dropped. I knew it was Alex, so I closed my curtain and ran upstairs to my parents' bedroom, almost in tears about Alex being at my window. My dad and I both went back down to my window, and no one was there. My dad thought Alex could still be there, just hiding in the bushes outside my window. My dad decided to try to scare him off, and went to turn on the back porch lights and call for my dogs. I didn't get any more knocks at my window for maybe two minutes. I heard another knock and told my dad. He just marched straight outside at this point and found him sitting by my window, with his hood up, I don't know what happened, but the police were called, and they had to escort him back to his house. It was terrifying, but I was pissed at that point. Why wouldn't he just leave me alone? It doesn't stop there, however. The next day during math class, I sat in a spot that faces the window. With my back to the door, halfway through the hour, one girl in the class shouts out my name, telling me to look behind me. I turn around, as does the rest of the class. And there was Alex, standing intently above me, silent. I got up, ready to punch him in the face, but he ran out the door. I just stood in the doorway of the room and broke into tears. Three other people comforted me, and my girlfriend told the teacher what was going on. The scariest part, however, was that I never told him my schedule. Later that day, my mom, Tanya, and I went to the police at our school. When the officer said we could do a no-contact agreement, we ruled it out because it would take too long to put into place. With only a few days left in school, later when the officer talked to Alex, asking him what he did, he said it was because neither me nor my sister told him no. It was near the end of the year, and nothing happened with him over the summer. My sophomore year, though, I had another class with him. I immediately told the teacher about everything so that she knew, and everyone in class protected me from him. I had no further incidents from him. The teacher actually cared about me, 
and is now one of my close friends. My sophomore year was clear of any incidences, and I had pretty much forgotten the existence until recently. I woke up and checked my phone after turning off the alarm. I saw that I had gotten a random Facebook message from someone I didn't know. My Facebook is about as private as it gets, so I didn't know that it was possible to receive messages from people that I wasn't friends with on Facebook. My sophomore year, Alex was supposed to graduate, but he didn't. His name wasn't even said at the ceremony, and wasn't even listed in the program. Tanya and I both laughed about it, but we knew that it meant that he was going to be in our city longer. I looked at it anyways, and it was very sexual messages. It was annoying, and I get messages like that all the time from bots on Instagram, so I would have ignored it, but because it was on Facebook Messenger, it was really strange. I clicked on the person's name, and their profile came up. I scrolled through the pictures, and I saw a picture that made my heart sink. A picture of Alex. It was Alex's profile, and he had messaged me, and changed the profile's name and location. I only showed it to a few people, but not to my parents yet. I showed it to my current boyfriend, who showed it to his mom, and she told me to tell my parents. The reason we showed it to a teacher was because he'd been around the school grounds within the last few weeks, and she may be able to do something about it. Nothing has happened with Alex since, but if something else happens, there is a chance he won't make it out of the situation alive, because I'm fed up with him, and he's caused me and my family enough grief. Please be careful who you choose to make friends with, and what sort of information you give out. Don't put yourself through what I've been through. I met my stalker when I was in middle school. My school consisted of 7th grade through 12th grade and had a normal program and an accelerated program with the students in each program being pretty segregated. My friends and I belonged to the accelerated program, but there was one guy in the group from the normal program. His name was Carson. All in all, we were typical teenagers with Carson being the group's prankster. We only could hang out at school because we were all shipped in from various parts of the county for the accelerated program. So after school, we would all get on AOL to chat and play games. Online, we had even more friends, and we'd invite our own local friends to also chat with us. One day, Carson invited his friend Steve to join the chat. He was nice and contributed to a lot of our conversations. We learned Steve actually attended our school, but he was in the normal program and had a different lunch period than the rest of us, so we had almost no chance of crossing paths. We insisted on meeting him, however, and we would schedule for Steve to come to my locker before first period. The next morning, we waited, and Steve never came. My friend and I did a, have a short exchange with another kid, Marco, which consisted of us telling him to go away. Marco had been Carson's satellite since the beginning of the year. Wherever Carson went, Marco would stand 10 to 15 feet away, just watching us. We had tried being friends with him, but he was simply too strange for us. He would touch your face unexpectedly, or try and sneak up behind you to bite you, or tell you he wanted to see you inside out. His list of strange behaviors was just a mile long. A few days later, Steve failed to come meet us. It came to light that Steve was really Marco, and that the whole thing was one of Carson's pranks. Considering Marco has been a pleasant addition to the chat as Steve, we gave him another chance to join the real group. Besides Carson, I was the only person that really gave Marco a chance. He still did the weird things he always has been doing, but it was now apparent that it was all an act to get attention for being the weird guy. Marco was being abused at home by his mom's boyfriend. He rarely saw his mom because she worked so much. Marco was the poster child for bad attention is still attention. Still, my friends wanted him out of the group, and I repeatedly found myself arguing his case to let him stay. Once I caught an older student, a boy that lived on my street, beating Marco up. Being much larger than either of us, he was literally picking Marco up and slamming him into lockers while he called him a freak. Knowing the bully and his mother, I did what was my signature move at the time, 
and kicked him in the balls while threatening to tattle on his parents about how he was treating me and my friends. I believe this was the catalyst for years of torment, as Marco became my satellite after that day. At school, Marco followed me any chance he got. At home, Marco messaged me non-stop, typically in a private chat. As my other friends wanted nothing to do with him, I felt bad because he was a sweet kid besides his attention-seeking stunts. And no one should have to go through life with no friends. Eventually, Marco asked me out, which I politely declined him. He was my friend, but he was not the type of guy that I would ever be interested in dating. He was persistent, though, begging me to give him a chance. Over and over again, I would have to tell him no. One day, his approach changed. You will go out with me, or I'll show your mom all our chat logs. There was nothing specially bad in those logs. I wasn't drinking or doing drugs or really anything bad, but I was pretty depressed at the times and sometimes talked about wanting to end myself. If my parents saw that, I could effectively kiss my freedom and privacy goodbye. I bluffed him, telling him good luck with any attempts to convince my parents to believe him over me, which seemed to work. I wasn't very impressed with the stunt and stopped talking to him. A few weeks went by, and Marco came crawling back, begging for my forgiveness. I eventually caved, allowing him back into the group. At first he was well behaved again, but slowly he started pestering me to be his girlfriend. Over the course of high school, he tried many different methods, begging, blackmailing, attacking my self-esteem, catfishing, threatening any guy I dated, threatening to end himself, and even more. I tried to be nice at first, but eventually had to get pretty mean in how I said no. His behavior would also reach a boiling point that forced me to cut him out of our friend group. It was nearly impossible to actually get rid of him. However, online he would create dozens of new accounts to send messages from, overwhelming my attempts to block him. He would call my phone all night long and leave woeful message about how lonely he was and how he would end himself if I stopped being his friend. He would show up at my house and stand outside my bedroom window randomly. When my parents had parties, he always managed to find out how and show up. Their parties were always pretty big with an open door policy, so he'd slip right in. He'd then ultimately do something to get thrown out, like getting belligerently drunk or stuff his face with finger foods and then put them back on the serving platters. The first time I really felt that Marco might actually be a threat was at one of my parents' Halloween parties when we were 16. One of my dad's friends had a son our age. His name was Tim. That was a bit of a jerk. He fancied himself pretty cool and thought it would be fun to pick a fight with the weird kid to make a display of his own superior strength. Marco accepted his challenge. We all knew he was about to get the crap beat out of him. Going out into the streets, Tim towered over Marco. That year, Marco was dressed as Alex from Clockwork Orange, with his costume, including a cane. He swung the cane at Tim, hitting him in the head with it. Tim went down quickly, and Marco beat him until an adult intervened and sent him home. Marco's go-to threat whenever I had a boyfriend was, I'll beat him to death with a shovel, and then use it to bury his body. Suddenly, this threat seemed like something he'd be capable of. Our senior year of high school... Marco's dad died in prison. He learned the real life lesson that his dad was in prison for murdering someone. He'd always thought that his dad was in for drugs, and Marco started to spiral out of control. He said his dad was a murderer, so he must also be doomed to be one. He dropped out of school halfway through that year. My brother said after I'd left home for college, Marco came to the house looking for me a few times. Once he figured out I wasn't there, He'd just come and stand in the front yard aimlessly, playing with a Bic lighter, until someone threatened to call the cops. One of my biggest worries was that he'd try to set their house on fire in some weird way of trying to punish me. When I'd go home with my boyfriend, he'd always show up at my parents' house. At one point, he tried to intimidate my boyfriend into breaking up with me by showing him he had a hunting knife. It was always a big ordeal getting him to leave. A lot of the issues have now eased up just due to the distance and time. I don't use much social media anymore, and I'm able to semi-block people on my phone. Initially, 
He was calling and texting every day, hundreds of messages. I tried asking him to stop, but this only encouraged him more. My family no longer lives in that area, so I'm significantly less worried for their safety. I found the most successful way of dealing with Marco is simply just ignoring him. Eventually, his message dwindled down to once a week, then once a month. Now I maybe hear from him officially once a year. His message is typically something along the lines of, Please, just be my friend. I won't try for anything more. I need you in my life. The last time I actually talked to him, which was about four to five years ago now, Marco tried to tell me I'd ruined his life. He said I had put some spell on him that now he couldn't move forward with his life. He told me he would end himself, and it would be my fault. I finally had to tell him that I wouldn't care if he ended himself. In fact, it would be a relief to me. His most recent M.O. is to call my work phone from a private number just to hear me answer the phone and then hang up. He also calls and texts my brother, our high school friends, my brother's friend, my parents, my grandparents, my aunt, and my husband to beg them to ask me to call him. Marco messaged my husband, tell her she is my angel, the love of my life. I'm nothing without her. I worry he will snap someday and show up at my house, order my job to end me. I have security systems and other means of protection, but I still get paranoid about it. I've talked to the police about getting a restraining order, but they've told me there's no grounds unless he does start showing up and threatening to end me. So I guess we'll see what happens now. I had always been a bit of a tomboy, and never dated boys in high school. I wasn't interested in dating, and I was oblivious when guys showed interest in me. That's why I didn't find it at all weird when I got friended on MySpace by a friend I used to know by the name of James. James went to my elementary school until about fourth grade. When we moved just one town over, back in the 90s, there wasn't many ways for kids that young to keep in touch with each other. So no one really had heard from him until the beginning of the story. I see his request, and I automatically accept it. I wasn't one of those teenagers who just accepted every friend request I got. I knew this kid, so shortly after reuniting on MySpace, we reminisced about random kid memories from where we were in the same class. You know, you know, normal stuff that kids would talk about. Somehow we exchanged our phone numbers. Texting was relatively new back then, so unlimited plans were just becoming mainstream. We would text each other again about random memories and what we were doing that day. One thing that sticks to my mind is that we talked about buying Gerardo's which are sodas without a twist top cap. Every once in a while during our texting conversations, James would add something cheesy into the mix. Like, you just remember, you're beautiful, or some weird, cheap, corny joke like that. I brushed them off, or ignored them, and just continued the conversations. If he was interested, I just was going to pretend I didn't know about it. But here's where I feel like I broke out of my character. James and I eventually talked about just meeting up to chill and hang out. He wanted to go to this really grungy carnival right near our town, about 20 minutes away from me. And I was like, sure, why not? I had only had my license for just a few months, and I was always down to get away from my secluded country house. I met up with James and his friends at the carnival. We walk around the grounds a bit, and I meet everybody. His friends were awkward, yet nice. They all wanted to go get Wendy's, so we get in one kid's big old Cadillac and just drive off. As soon as we start driving, I feel uneasy. This kid, whose name escapes me, was driving all over the road, hitting curbs, and yelling at all the other drivers. And I spoke up to him. I told him he should probably treat his grandpa's car a little bit better. He replied with something careless, so I just dropped it. When we got to Wendy's, which was within walking distance of James's house, 
I told him I wasn't getting back in that Cadillac. James obliged, so he walked to his mom's house, borrowed their car, and then he dropped me off at my truck at the carnival. When we parted ways, he moved closer to me, from the passenger side of the car, for a weird hug. On my way home, I got a text from James that said, Truck hugs are awkward and weird. In my head, I'm like, no crap, dude. But I replied with something like, then maybe we shouldn't do that anymore. For some reason, a week or two had passed. I agreed to hang out with him again, by his request and his request only. He wanted to go walk the canal in his town, so I figured that it sounded like fun. He tried to take my hand, and I took it away. We walked the canal and talked about stuff, and he asks if I wanted to go to the golf course to explore some stuff. Now at this point it's getting pretty dark, but again, I thought it sounded like fun. So I offered to drive him. I do like being in control. It's how I feel the safest. He stopped at the tennis courts, and from his wallet he brings a piece of notebook paper ripped into a rectangle that read, Good for one free back rub. I thought it was kind of funny. So I scratched his back quickly, and we left. Like I said, it was getting dark. We get to the golf course, and James grabs my hand to hold on to it again. I'm really not into him like that, but I let it happen anyways. As darkness closes the golf course, we wander the grounds, which is probably not okay, and James keeps trying to wrap his arms around me. I pulled away for the first few times, but yet he continued. He pulls me from the edge of the ground and into the road as the car is coming and tries to make out with me in the street. I pull him away, disgusted at the metallic taste left behind his sharp braces. I say I'm ready to go, yet he pulls me towards him again, stands there holding me in the road, kissing me against my will, as a blazer blares its horn at us, blinding me in its headlights. Okay, seriously, it's time to go, I told him. I took him home, and I felt funny. When I dropped him off, he kissed me again. That one was okay, I guess. I think back then I was in the mindset that you have to do what the boys want. For some reason, I wish I didn't. The third and final time I agreed to hang out with James. He came to my house to show me his new huge truck that he had bought. Since he got his cool new job at the factory, and could afford it at about 17. We sat on the couch watching Family Guy with my 13-year-old brother popping out from upstairs to be annoying every hour or so. Eventually, James thought it would be cool to snuggle up to me. He got kind of pushy and started sticking his hands in my shirt, saying, I like these. And I replied, everyone makes fun of me, saying they're small. I don't know why I didn't push him off, and he proceeded to try to kiss me tongue kissing me, just awkwardly trying to push and aggressively make me kiss him, and it wasn't what I wanted. He stuck his hand in my shorts, and it kind of hurt. I told him to stop, and I told him it was time for him to go. He tried to protest, but I made up some excuse that my brother was around, and it wasn't okay to do that in the living room. The next day, he started texting me again, asking if I liked last night and I told him he needed to keep his hands to himself next time. He replies with, I can't tame them, but maybe you can. And I ignored him. Here's where this gets real out of hand. At this point, I didn't want anything to do with James. He was pushy, and didn't respect my boundaries, and he clearly wanted to date me, or something else, because the weird corny texts never stop. Never once did he just say, hey, I like you. But the creepiest of all corny was after a couple of days of not speaking. I get a text from James while I was on my way to work. Knock knock, he said. And I hesitated, but I wrote, Who's there? from the parking lot of my job. I was a cashier at our small grocery store, and there was a strict no phone policy at our register. So my phone stayed in the break room at all times. Three hours later on my break, I'm reading my text, and James has replied, Aardvark, I feel really uncomfortable at this, and I say, Aardvark who? Aardvark a million miles for you, 
This is where I just got mean to him. I said, you wouldn't, and you shouldn't. And there's some other stuff about leaving me alone. He replies, I'll prove it to you. Let me come over tonight. I lied and said, I can't. I have to watch my brother and sister tonight. James begs me, please, I just want to prove it to you. I'll walk the whole way. Remember, his house is about 20 minutes by car from me, on mostly isolated roads bordered by farmland. But again, I tell him no, I'm not allowed to have anyone over tonight. I thought it was done. I get out of work at 9.15, grab my phone, and there's a text from James. It's kind of creepy walking on a road in the dark. And I flipped. You are not walking to my house right now. I told you I'm not allowed to have anyone over. Turn around right now and walk back home. I drive home and I feel okay. My brother is on the couch watching TV. My brother is a champion hunter and was brought up by my father to love and respect guns. He had his bow and a shotgun in his room. Even though he was 13 or 14 at the time, it just made me feel a whole lot better. I don't get another text until midnight. I'm on the road about two minutes away. I tell him to turn around and to go back to his grandma's house. I tell him he better not come over to my house or I will call the cops. I am frozen in my chair. Our living room has a large window and curtains are usually open because we have no neighbors. Even then the curtains are translucent. They don't really do anything. I'm too frozen by shock and fear and I don't even know to close them anyway. I look over at my brother who's fast asleep on the couch across from the room. I'm too frozen to wake him up. On the enclosed porch, my big dogs Jenny and Tanner slept. I called my mom, my dad, and my family friend who is a tough lady, and like my second mom in many ways. My parents were sleeping, and our family friend was out at the bar and couldn't hear her phone. So I sat there frozen on the couch, TBS channel muted on my TV, and waiting. I don't know why I didn't call the cops. I think it was because James's cousin was my sister's best friend, and I didn't want rumors to start. James texts me, telling me, I'm on your road. I freak out again, and tell him not to come up my driveway, that I will call the cops. I have to mention that he wasn't physically threatening, just creepy and invasive. I just wanted him gone. I didn't want him around to look at me or know about me. And then nothing for about three hours. James texts me, I'm at my grandmother's, and then I ask him if he's okay. And he went into a tirade of insults and criticism. You don't have to be a bitch. I was going to ask you to be my girlfriend. I've never done any of that. I just wanted to see you in person and thought we could talk. You made me walk all that way. And I replied with the obvious, like me politely and directly telling him not to come repeatedly. I wasn't supposed to have anyone over anyways. He had a vehicle. Then as a test to see if he came down the driveway, I asked him if he woke the dogs up. He said Tanner stayed asleep and Jenny wasn't there, which was true. I did get up to ask Jenny to come sit with me. The part that bothered me the most was that I was very clear the whole time that I did not want him over here. Still terrified at 4 or 5 o'clock a.m., I finally feel like I can go to my room. I barely sleep, and at 6 a.m. my family friend, who comes over with her girlfriend, I come out because I hear the dogs barking and squeaking in excitement. I sat on the porch as they unload their overnight bags, and I see two objects on the front doorsteps. That notebook paper coupon, and a brand new bottle opener keychain. My dogs never heard him, and they never bark. I heard from him a couple times after that, and I pretended to be a teenager who couldn't spell the name Sarah, hoping he would think I changed my number. 